Greetings internet, once again it's your soul here and uh, I've just come back from a weekend uh, event basically where I spoke and gave a presentation titled uh, Decentralizing the World and the World Wide Web and that's available online but the, the issue we had there was that the event got a bit delayed and uh, I didn't have as much time as I really needed to go into in, in enough depth and it is quite a complicated subject so since I put a lot of slides together and uh, you know put quite a bit of time into organising it, I figured I would just upload this video and and give a more sort of focused version of it. Um, so yeah, so in essence, this is as you can see uh, insights from systems engineering. So my background is in systems engineering. That's what I was trained to do at university. And I, I mean, I've been programming computers since I was four years old. I just have a, a kind of inherent ability to uh, translate information into the world of computing and back out again I guess is one way of putting it. Uh, I've also in my life been involved in many different fields as well making music and learning about healing and uh, running businesses and lots of other things as well so I'm a little bit unusual in my experience when it comes to systems engineering in that I have quite a lot of insights from outside of systems engineering to actually add into systems engineering logic um, so that I can actually see solutions and ideas and understandings which often get missed. And so that's partially why I'm inspired to, to talk about these subjects. So what I'm actually doing here is, is drawing attention to the reality that systems and systems engineering apply not just to computing, but also to many other things, including uh, social systems, uh, political systems, human body even, uh, basically anything you can class as a system. Uh, I'm also going to be talking here about the upcoming uh, class action lawsuit, which is against um, Facebook and Google for their censorship of blockchain, which is definitely something which everybody on Steam and, and, and crypto in general needs to learn about because it's very, very important. And I'm going to tie these two two subjects together. So uh, first up, we're going to start, start off with some definitions because uh, if we if we don't all uh, understand what's being said in the way that they're meant to be, you know, they're meant, the way I'm meaning to put them across, then there's no point in me even saying them. Uh, you don't have to necessarily agree with all these definitions, but I'm just going to put them out as, as pointing you to, to, you know, understanding, so you can understand that this is how I think of these things. Um, so at least you can understand what I'm saying. So... <clears throat> System theory is the interdisciplinary study of systems. So in other words, interdisciplinary meaning combining together numerous different forms of skill and um, background combined into a method of studying systems. And a system is a cohesive conglomeration of interrelated and interdependent parts that is either natural or man-made. So in other words, a bunch of things, en entities, aspects, processes, functions um, combined together and... Um, operating as, as a whole, and that may either be natural or man-made, as it says. So, Systems engineering is an interdisciplinary field of engineering and engineering management that focuses on how to design and manage complex systems. So this suits me quite well. I like this sort of role. I don't like to get stuck in one box. And, and ultimately, many people are used to um, using systems on the end, you know, the user side of things, and they don't really have any experience of making systems. I'm, I'm the other way around. I have more, ex well, I have significant experience of creating systems. And so I get very frustrated sometimes when I see old systems that we've inherited, such as political systems and um, financial systems and so on, that literally are some of them thousands of years old. And they're so out of date, it's absolutely absurd. And, and they're, they're not serving us at all. Um, so when I see these systems... I mean, I try to not use them, basically. I've tried to literally remove myself from these old systems because they just give me a headache. Um, and I can I see so many problems with them, it would probably drive me insane just to use them like a lot of people do. Um, so I'm very much involved in trying to replace these systems. And since those the people controlling the older systems don't really move quickly enough, they don't want things to change in many cases because they realise that an upgrade to their systems would mean that they would lose personal power. Uh, we don't really see them changing them very much, and, and that's part of the... It's really the root of a lot of the suffering on this planet right now is that we're using out-of-date systems. It's like, in a sense, if you tried to use uh, Windows 3.1 from whenever that was, back in the 90s, one of the very early versions of uh, Microsoft Windows, you tried to use that today, you would be in pain trying to achieve anything on that because it's so slow, out-of-date. Uh, on faster computers it's going to work, you know, a bit faster, but... It's not going to work with modern software, you can't use the internet properly, you know, it would just be painful to try and use it. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at with politics, is that we're using systems that are very early, unevolved, uh, overly complicated 
kind of legacy systems that in the world of systems we would have replaced long ago but because we're not because politics isn't really a world of people who understand systems and the necessity to evolve along with changes in the world they're basically they're trying to control things and fit them into their system rather than having their system respond to the world that's the problem so in other words their system is one that tries to limit free will in order to regulate it and unfortunately for them uh, fortunately for everyone else, this is a free will planet and free will is more powerful than political systems. Um, so we need to have systems that respect free will uh, and that work with us and with free will and that allow us to be free rather than systems that try and dominate everything. So that's really what this talk is about and it's what my life is really focused heavily into achieving. So I'm sure everyone on Steam, most people already understand what blockchain is. Just for people who may not be aware, a very brief summary. Blockchain technology is a form of decentralized data storage, utilizing a network of computers operated by different entities in different locations, working together via consensus. So in layman's terms, basically that's a way of storing information in a computer system, uh, whereby the computers are not all in one building, they're not all operated by one group or person. They are actually operated, they're all over the world potentially and can be controlled by numerous different people. But the, the code is cleverly designed so that they can all work together as one. Uh, so that's what blockchain is, allows um, and that's part of the amazing kind of benefits that we have from blockchain. It's not, it doesn't seem to be very well understood or deliberately hidden by some of those people advising governments and so on, perhaps for their own benefits. Um, but there is a lot of power to be had in this kind of topology of a network. Um, so we have here just a comment that I wrote about blockchain. There, uh, blockchain technology is resilient in the sense that uh, because it's distributed over many different um, nodes, different people, uh, if there's a failure along the way then that can be easily picked up. Uh, the slack can be picked up by other people. It's transparent in that the system is generally open source. You can usually look at the source code, you can look at the code, you can find out what's happening. You can examine all the transactions which is the complete opposite of our legacy, our inherited systems that we see in banks and governments and so on. They claim to be transparent, but they, they're not. Uh, and in the case of Steam and other blockchains, it's censorship resistant. So um, because it's transparent, it's basically very difficult or impossible to truly censor someone, um, which is very important. Blockchain makes it possible for each of us to be the vote counter in political votes. Now, I didn't really talk so much about this uh, over the weekend, but this is very important. Uh, Oracle D, the team on Steam, have been in negotiation and have done a deal, I think. I'm not sure exactly how far they've got with that at this point, but as I understand it, the Indonesian government and potentially other governments are looking to actually do their vote counting on Steam, on the blockchain, because it gives the individual regions a way to count votes and to produce the proof of that, um, those counts locally on the blockchain in a fully public way that's very difficult to corrupt. So we may see the end of the days when r votes are completely rigged uh, and typically, as I understand it, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure most votes are rigged in America and Britain. I'm, you know, I've seen lots of evidence for that um, from all different directions going back decades. I'm 95% sure that most elections are completely rigged. Uh, and if you think about it, it's not difficult to do that. You basically just, in each region where the people, local people perhaps count the votes, they count them, you know, maybe 75% accurately, uh, some dishonesty going on, let's say just a rough figure. Uh, but then what happens is when they centralise those counts into the sort of central offices, it basically means you've only got to corrupt that one central office wherever the final count is made and all the rest of it's irrelevant. And, and it's fairly straightforward from that perspective. You don't have to have, you know, 100,000 people corrupted. You only need a fairly small number of people. So by being able to put the, the vote counts on the blockchain, that significantly changes politics. Um, Unfortunately, it doesn't change the fact that democracy itself is still imbalanced in that it actually is an overpowering of many people. It doesn't support individuality sufficiently. It, unless, unless the democracy agrees to fully support individuality as part of its constitution, in which case it's not really a constitution, it's a republic, um, and there's arguments to be made for a strong constitution um, which would form a republic. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, I didn't really have a slide for this, but the difference between a democracy and a republic, as I understand it, is... A democracy is basically a situation where the majority vote determines the outcome. So let's say 52 or whatever percent of people, if they all agree on something, then that's going to happen. Uh, that's the policy. A uh, republic is a bit different in that you have a constitution which is much more difficult to change. And um, 
still can be changed, but tends to not be changed so much. It's meant to be designed so that um, it's a very good guardian of freedom, let's say. And uh, so if a government comes along, or the democracy, the democratic process creates a policy change, it has to be within the basic agreed constitution or it's not valid. Um, so that kind of reins in the power of, of parliaments or governments not to do crazy things. Uh, obviously there's an issue with that in that constitutions themselves can be changed and there has to be some sort of voting process for that. So it's definitely not perfect. Um, and I think we have the same problem if you look at the American constitution, for example. Um, you know, that, I don't even know when the last time that was changed was. It was quite, I think it was pretty sure it was a long time ago. And yet the world's moved on. So there's definitely a necessity to keep agility and change present within a constitution in order for it to be relevant. Uh, and that really brings us back to the same problem we have with democracy in the first place, which is that um, as soon as you've got a group of people making decisions for everyone else, you've got a problem. Because, you know, it basically means that some people are going to come out of it feeling overpowered. They're not going to feel good about it. They're not going to like it. Um, and who's to say they're wrong? You know, just because the majority agrees something doesn't mean to say the majority are right. The majority can absolutely be wrong. Uh, I think, you know, we look at Nazi Germany, for example, as a great example, and other sort of authoritarian regimes. In some cases, the majority of people agreed with it, but that doesn't make it right, does it? So um, it's down for the individuals of the planet to empower themselves to understand what truly is right and wrong. And that requires quite a lot of focus and thought, but it can be done. I'm fairly sure it can be done. Uh, it requires emotional connection as well to understand ultimately when we're being overpowered and what kinds of ideas are overpowering, which kind of ideas aren't overpowering. Uh, that's a kind of a deep topic. I'm not going to get too much into that, but um, that's my truth anyway. So following on from that, another definition, balance. So no part or aspect is overpowering any other. And this is something that isn't really, I mean, you can debate it, but... But this, you can test this. This is something that applies to physics. It applies to social systems and your relationship with other people. It applies to your own internal reality. If your mind is overpowering your emotions, then you won't feel good. You won't have so much power. If a component of an engine or a computer system is causing another uh, element to be um, lacking in power or resources, then the system's going to fail. Uh, same in a society. If one group has too much power over other people, then... Uh, there's going to be problems and friction and complaints and violence and so on, probably. So balance literally is no aspect is overpowering any other. It's a very simple definition. It's something that I only learned fairly late on in my life. And it's, this is something, if you only took one thing from this whole presentation, it should probably be this, because this, when it's enacted and understood deeply enough, can solve pretty much all problems. Um, so control, to exercise authoritative or dominating influence over. So often we're told that... Um, control is a good thing we must have self-control we must have a centralized force that can control things I, I don't really agree with that um and i think it comes down to definitions so to exercise authoritative or dominating influence over well who likes to be nominated who likes to have an alleged voice of authority controlling them no one really unless you're kind of a masochist uh, or somebody who's just a slightly lost and doesn't really have any sense of self-empowerment or sense of self. Um, so to be controlled is not a good thing. So automatically then, if you're saying that control is a good thing, you're setting up a conflict. You're setting up you know, people trying to vie for control. And that's what we've seen in history for the last few thousand years at least, is different groups not working together and trying to dominate them, each other and themselves often as well. Um, people tend to think of control in a more sort of optimistic angle or from a more optimistic angle and think of it as to adjust, adjusting to a requirement to regulate. That's a nice way of saying dominating influence over. Uh, it's kind of like, oh, well, yeah, we know that control doesn't really feel or look very good to people. So we'll just neutralize things and say, well, we've got this requirement, this mission statement, and we have to regulate things to make that happen. Well, Here's the thing, these two are in contradiction because you can adjust to a requirement without exercising authoritative or dominating influence over. This is a dictionary definition. Dictionary definitions are often not correct. They're not, they're, they're not logically coherent, um, especially when it comes to things relating to power. Um, so to give an example, you could have a group agreeing of their own volition to adjust something to a requirement and to regulate it whatever that might be, let's say pollution levels or something like that. 
but you don't have to have anyone exercising authority or dominating influence in order to make that happen. You can just do it voluntarily. Uh, and equally to hold in restraint, um, I mean, yeah, there's, there are situations when you need to hold things in restraint for certain reasons. You've got a um, force or motive or movement which is uh, p potentially going to overpower other ones, and so there needs to be some sort of method to bring balance. Um, but again, that doesn't mean to say you have to have domination. Uh, you need to have, ultimately, a deeper way to create the balance, and that's what I'm all about. That's what I've learned to do to some extent in myself, and you know, I know that most people have never even, you know, this subject doesn't come up for most people. We're not taught about this in school or anything like that, so I love talking about it. So more definitions. Control of others is overpowering and thus a loss of balance. So, you know, the idea of government having a police force and a military and, oh, we need that and that's what keeps us strong and, you know, a strong unified force and all this kind of thing. Well, no, it's not. That's what actually causes the discord that actually you then think you need the police and the military to try to control. The fact that the police and military are there and that things are being forced onto people causes imbalance, which then get you get a response to such as we've seen in france recently uh with the uh, yellow vest kind of rioting um and then that seems to justify the police and the military it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy as soon as you've got a force trying to control another force you'll get a reaction to that uh, i mean um, physicists might say that's a, one of the laws of thermodynamics uh, every action has an equal and opposite reaction um i'm fairly sure that's not strictly a law but um without going too deeply into that um <laughs> The point is, you do certainly get in social systems um, a response from one group when another group tries to take control. Um, and justifying just because you're wearing the badge and the uniform that you're the right in the right is just nonsense. It's just not provable logically. Um, so revolution is going back to the start and repeating a cycle. Uh, so we're often told that, oh, we must have a revolution and, um, you know, humanity needs a revolution. We're due one. Change is needed. We need a revolution. Well... Anybody who studies history knows that revolutions are well named because they generally tend to result in things just going back to how they were before the revolution, but with a form change. So, you know, you may have a tyrant running a country and then there's a revolution and the tyrant's killed or removed. Uh, and then another system comes in that looks better, but it tends to start to repeat um, some of the same problems over and over again. Some things might get fixed, but then you might get new problems coming in. And, it, and it's because basically there hasn't been an evolution. So you could have a revolution and an evolution, but typically we tend, because of the lack of understanding and necessity of evolution, and understanding of the necessity of evolution, we tend to end up more with revolutions without evolution. So evolution is change that builds on the lessons of the past, ultimately. That's how I define it at the moment. So um, in other words, you are deliberately learning as much as you can from everything that's gone before, and you are building deliberately on that intelligently, rather than just kind of setting aside um, the deeper aspects of reality and the lessons from the past and just charging ahead with what you say is right just because you say it's right. Uh, and an evolution, when done correctly, or when it is real evolution, should result in improvements. It should result in increased abilities, greater efficiency, better feelings, happiness, so on, for people involved. So there's another key point. Um, there's a lot of misinformation in the world and there's a lot of alleged common sense which really is illogical and isn't correct uh, according to the definitions that most people are using anyway and it's provable so power is the in the dictionary sense is only the ability to act that's all power is there's no other real overarching functional definition for it it's just the ability to act so when people say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely which is a famous quote that's just wrong it's so wrong it's just silly Power does not automatically corrupt. You need power just to open your mouth. You need power just to stand up. You need power to breathe, to be alive. So if you claim that power automatically corrupts, you're also claiming that corruption is completely unstoppable. There's no way to not have corruption. And I don't agree with that. Um, I don't think I put a definition in here for corruption, but uh, corruption for me ultimately is a deviation from the truth. It's a deviation. It's, it's the insertion of denial it's deliberate, malicious and heartless intentions, ultimately, in terms of social psychology and so on. Um, if you think about a hard drive on a computer, for example, hard drives can get corrupted, they can stop working, and they do, typically, eventually, older technology does. But it is possible to have a hard drive that doesn't get corrupted. Uh, newer technologies, the um, solid-state drives, 
um, generally don't tend to get corrupted. I, I mean, they do break eventually, and you know, you could call that a form of corruption, but um, they tend to retain uh, fidelity and, and accuracy up until the point they completely fail. Uh, so anyway, I mean, obviously we're not hard drives, but the point I'm getting at is it, it is possible to identify the causes of corruption and then stop them so we don't have any more corruption. And it might seem impossible, but I logically it's possible. Um, so we need power. Um, and basically the real corruption is power over and overpowering. So when a group or an entity overpowers other people, has more power over other people, and stops those people doing what they need to do, even when those people are doing things that don't hurt anyone or are not overpowering anyone else, then we have overpowering and that's a problem. And this is often done because entities or people prefer to, they try to increase their own power by taking power from other people, ultimately. That's really the problem. And, and they don't understand that they can have enough power for what they need to do everything they need to do and not take any from anyone else. And often it's fear motivating that, you know, they think they don't have enough power. These people have got too much power, we must take it. And this would be going on almost probably forever. And it needs to stop, basically, it just needs to stop. We can't survive at this point with this madness happening. People have got to evolve and realise that we need to claim our power and use our power in a balanced way and not just keep trying to steal it from each, each other. Um, we need real balance. So a couple more definitions. Totalitarianism. Uh, is a system of government that is centralised and dictatorial and requires complete subservience, which means compliance and obedience to the state. So you don't have any say in the system, you don't have any uh, personal power. It's the complete opposite of freedom, basically. Um, and there's a few of those that have happened throughout history. And corrupt systems tend to veer closer to that, and less corrupt systems move away from that. Now here's an interesting one, a subject, uh, in terms of people, is it means basically to bring a person or a country under one's control, typically by using police and military force. So in a monarchy, it's said that the people are the subjects of the monarch. And living in Britain, I've never liked that, you know, uh, being told that I'm subservient to this person I've never met. Um, you know, why would anyone want that? You wouldn't, would you? No one would. It's something that's been forced on you and you never asked for it. Um, so it's out of balance and you know why should anyone be subject to someone else think about the word author authority it, it's the word author which means basically writing and creating so if someone's an authority over you that means they get they get to write your life well did you agree to that I mean I didn't <laughs> and there's a lot of assumptions being made that just because you're in a region or an area that you've automatically agreed to this but that's just not true you were born into it no one asked you, so this is just denial. It's massive denial, and it's never gonna. This problem's never gonna get solved, and until we really look at this and accept that this is what's happened, because it's just a problem. It, you, the people at the top of the hierarchies aren't gonna solve it because they like being at the top of the hierarchies, and people at the bottom of the hierarchies often are distracted so much by not having enough resources or not, you know, lots of other things that they never quite manage to figure time out to look at this in enough detail to realise what's happened and to look for solutions. So. I'm suggesting now that we uh, we find a real balance. It doesn't have to involve violence. I would really like, you know, that it doesn't involve violence. There's already violence happening in France. Nothing at all to do with me. I don't speak French. I'm not involved with them. Um, you know, th these kind of things are going to flare up and fire up no, no matter what I say. Um, what I'm really trying to do here is to guide us towards a balanced future that doesn't involve violence um, and that can work for everyone. And I'm pretty sure I know how to do that. And I'm not alone. So at some point we're going to get there. So, self-empowerment, a radical idea or just common sense? And, you know, many people would say, well, obviously it's common sense, we need self-empowerment, but there are people who see things completely the other way around, and it's illogical to me, but, but they will basically say that, uh, you know, people shouldn't be empowered, and it should be, power should be centralised in the hands of people who are intelligent enough to use it. And that's a justification that was, that's been used for quite a long time for, for centralisation of power. The academics and intelligentsia kind of claim that and people around them claim that they are, you know, the best people to be making decisions, full stop, and so it's dangerous to allow everyone else to have power in their own lives. I don't agree with that at all. So stop interfering with other people's lives. The thing is, we haven't had the experience, really, of a society, certainly not in living memory or recorded history, uh, where there wasn't a lot of interfering with other people's lives. So to claim that that doesn't work... Um, you know, that's it's just wrong, it's closed-minded. You, you don't have the data to show that that doesn't work, basically. And it may take several generations to see the benefit of what happens when we collectively stop interfering with each other's lives. 
um, you know, we've got a lot of trauma and, and limiting belief systems that we've, we're have we carrying because of all of this stuff that's happened um, with wars and governments and taxes and all this stuff. Um, I would strongly suggest that we have an experiment with uh, stopping interfering with other people's lives and we can all do that individually and we can also not stand for other people interfering with our lives as well. Um, being controlled by others hugely limits success, um, which is a, maybe a slightly controversial um, perspective in that, for example, um, if you think about businesses and managers, you know, people will say, well, you need managers to manage teams or, or the teams aren't organised enough. But from my own experience, a good manager can achieve good things if they're you know, more aware and uh, open-minded, uh, more aware than the people they're managing, let's say, and uh, open-minded and they're you know, just good at their job. But um, that doesn't mean to say you can't have a team working without a manager who manages themselves or who direct themselves through communication um, that works better and more efficiently because they're the people doing the jobs. They know what needs to be done better than a manager probably does. Um, in my experience, that's true. So, so I'm all about self-empowerment and then that removes the middle layer. Uh, and I don't think it's an accident that manager is a conjunction of man and age in the sense that a manager is ageing a man or a person. It's a man-ager. Uh, and anybody who's had a bad manager or, or many managers... Uh, we'll probably know the stress that they get through that process and stress as we know causes aging so uh, <laughs> to me that's fairly you know it's a, a telling word there um, wars and violence are an outcome of control as i was kind of pointing to as soon as we try and control someone it sets in motion a set of actions and events and energies that typically results in some sort of fight back and conflict in a sense controlling others is a form of violence so in a sense, violence isn't just an outcome of control. Control actually is a form of violence, in a sense, if we're controlling other people. So yeah, I've said that here. Control of others is both violation and potential violence. No one really knows exactly what others need. And this is a key point as well. Um, you know, we can really know ourselves very deeply. We can feel that we understand life and humans very deeply and we can be sure that we're right about what's right and so on. But everyone's unique. There's just no way around that. And everyone has a piece of the puzzle and it might look to me like I really know what X and X person really needs, but it doesn't mean to say that I'm right. And, and really, only they can decide for themselves through their own feelings and experiences and what they desire and so on, what's right for them. And, and th this completely destroys the concept of democracy as being a logical, fair outcome, because uh, democracy is kind of based on the idea that the majority gets to decide for everyone else what they need, in effect. Um, and that just can never work. And, and that's why we have so many problems in societies that, that kind of have, have held up the idea that, a belief really, that democracy is the ultimate solution. It just isn't. Um, that doesn't mean to say I'm advocating for, for any sort of dictatorship or anything like that. What I'm advocating for is the opposite of dictatorship, um, the opposite direction, away from dictatorship, past democracy, and into actual real freedom. And I'm going to get onto a bit more detail about how that might be achieved. Uh, last point here, making judgments always results in a denial of some kind. So a judgment, I mean, this is a big subject. I'm not going to be able to get into all of this, but in short, a judgment is a thought that attempts to fill in the gaps in understanding so that uh, basically because we're just not comfortable with not knowing the truth of something and we're just going to guess, you know, we might panic a little bit or however you, you know, get concerned. We need to know and we'll just fill in a gap. Um, that's what judgment is. And people assume that you must make judgments. But that just isn't true. Um, I don't need to make a judgment about how many cars there are parked outside this house. I can just go and look. And I'm okay with not knowing until I go and look. Um, if I'm in a situation where I absolutely must have a, 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 something to go on, like, I don't know, there's a meteorite coming to hit the house and, uh, you know, I need to know how long I've got before I can do certain things to move out and escape, um, maybe I'm going to have to make some sort of guess. But I'm going to bear in mind that it was a guess. I'm not going to say, oh, that's the truth. And really, that's what judgments are. They're a guess held up as the truth um, or acted on as if they are the truth. Um, and they always, therefore, result in a denial of some kind. So that basically means you've always lost the real truth when you, when you hold on to judgments. And the real problem comes when judgments are taken in as truth and passed on through generation or through time and time and time again. And we just forget that they're even judgments. We don't. Even, we just take them to be complete truth. And and a lot of our thoughts and beliefs are actually that. They're things that we hold to be true, ideas we hold to be true, which just aren't, and, and which we don't examine. And w having looked closely into my own judgments as much as I was able to at the time, and that of society, I've realised that a huge percentage of what people claim to be true, without any evidence, even in the world of science, 
Uh, it just isn't true at all. And there's good, you know, it's provably the case. Um, so also when we consider that the court systems are based on judgment, you know, passing judgment on people, you realise why we're in such a mess again, because it basically means the court system is based on a bias of, of centralised power, whereby the truth is r routinely and habitually denied in favour of whatever someone makes up, basically. Um, you know, I'm not saying they're all deliberately trying to hurt people and malicious, but there's no getting around the fact that if decisions about people's destinies are being based on judgments, then you're automatically going to be causing lots of problems. Um, and how do we know whether the court system's making more problems or solving more problems in, in the overall picture? The fear of the fact that you may end up in jail wrongly is a real fear for many people and dra may dramatically probably affects the behaviour of many people, even people who are doing nothing wrong just because they're afraid of a corrupt system. Uh, and who knows how much that's holding uh, the community and humanity back. You know, I, I would suggest it's quite a lot. So if we can solve all these issues, then that's awesome, and I'm going to try and do it. And I, I suggest we all put our thinking caps on, or uncap our thinking, let's say, to, uh, to actually achieve that. And here's a good quote I saw. If I give them the power to feed me, I give them the power to starve me, which is absolutely true, and part of why we're seeing so many problems on the world today. Let's go back. Right. So the ability to liberate human populations depends on changing the programming involved, just like changing a computer system. We must address and reform the education systems urgently to do this. So if you create your own programming and you're aware of it and you're able to change it in real time, then programming isn't such a problem. It's just a method. It's a process for you achieving something. There's nothing wrong with it. If you're given programming and you don't even necessarily realise it's programming, it's just in you, it's unconscious, and you're just acting on it without even realising, it's a problem. And, and that often is what's happening in our society. People are being given information, taking it as if it's true, programmed to repeat it in order to pass exams, they don't even fully understand where the information came from, or if it's really true or not, and then they'll continue on in life, you know, maybe they never look at those subjects again, but in the back of their mind, oh, this is true, this is true, this is true. So it's influencing the rest of their life, and they never find out that it wasn't even all true. And, and I went through that, you know, a lot of the things I was taught at school, either, la either they were half-truths or they were just totally wrong, I found out later, from all subjects, except for language, well, even in languages, actually, um, even in math, so, to a lesser extent. Um, so we need to be agile, we need to be allowing the upgrades to come into our systems, is what it comes down to. Again, if you're stuck with Windows 3.1, you're not going to get very far. If you're stuck with a mind that was programmed in the 1980s, you're not going to get very far. If you're stuck with a program, a mind that was programmed full stop that you can't change, you're not going to get very far. So we have to learn how to remain open to change and understand the science and art of change itself and, and, and you know how to do that and how to change ourselves and so on. And that's when we're really going to accelerate and start solving problems like uh, geniuses, the geniuses that we, that we really are. Um, and obviously education systems are, are absolutely fundamental in that. And um, Yeah, it, reform in, in education systems is absolutely necessary. So, on to some actual systems logic and theory. So, these are three commonly uh, identified kind of structures for systems. You have centralised, decentralised and distributed. If we just look at these structures, we can see that um, one of them is clearly centralised in that the outer nodes or objects or entities or people, whatever you want to think of these hexagons as, uh, they're only connected to the central one. So if any of those nodes wants to connect to any of the other ones, it has to go through the central one. Uh, so this would be a bit like trying to talk to your friends on Facebook and you have to go through Facebook to talk to your friends. Uh, you can't, you know, there's no other way. Using via Facebook, you don't have a way of connecting directly to your friend without Facebook being involved, for example. Uh, decentralized doesn't have that central node. It has, a, in this example, a ring. So it's ultimately quite similar to centralized, but instead of having one central node, you have a ring that works together. So Steam is similar to that, the blockchain process or um, uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, social network, social ecosystem. Uh, so we don't have one central node like we do with Facebook. We actually have a group of witnesses and other um, entities who run servers who uh, collectively work together to... Um, make the system work. So if I try to connect to the Steam system, I don't just talk to, you know, Steamit Inc. or A Corporation to make that happen with my computer. I, I talk to a witness uh, or another and a bunch of other servers run by individuals around the world 
who take turns to take the responsibility of get, getting me my data. So that's quite an improvement over centralization um, in that uh, we have several controlling entities versus one single controlling entity, which is good because it means there's more space for change, more deviation, more um, cross-referencing and checking, maybe less space for corruption. But there's a problem in that we still have a centralization of power. And uh, although there's clever math involved that um, potentially expose when a certain number of these central nodes have become corrupted, uh, the problem is, in a sense, that if they all become corrupted, then the whole system's corrupted and no one's going to check it. Well, it can be checked, but uh, and we will find out, just like we will find out in the centralized system, we'll find out. But I found out I'm being censored on Facebook and it's corrupt, but the system still exists because I can't easily communicate that to everyone else because Facebook censors my comments. So, if the, you know, in other words, if this node here or a node in the centralized network discovers that the central node is corrupt, the central node can stop it telling all the other ones and then we have a problem. Uh, in the decentralized system, there's more chance of a, of a node on the, outer on the outer layers that discovers corruption on the inner layers. There's more chance of that message getting spread to everyone else. But ultimately, if the whole inner circle is corrupt, they can stop that message too. Um, so it's better than centralized, but not perfect. Distributed networks, on the other hand, are a completely different thing. Um, they are where there is no central entity, full stop. There's no ring of central entities. There's no single central entity. There's just a network. Um, and this is the real genius um, solution that needs to happen, I think, in all technologies that involve networks, ultimately. Um, so there's no controlling entity, and we're going to look a bit a bit more in, at that in detail as we move through. So um, I've kind of described some of these already, but it's just interesting to notice that a, a crown, for example, this picture of a crown, which you would have on a monarch, absolutely maps against this model of a, of a centralised structure, these uh, spines sticking out, and the head would be the central node head of the monarch um, yeah I don't think that's an accident I think these crowns are designed in a way to, to sort of reflect that focus of power in a way um, so so centralized systems are rigid they're top-down control held in place by overpowering typically um, so you know in, in order for Facebook to be able to be or in order to maintain the control they, they use overpowering so they'll st you know they'll stop you from posting they'll complain about you they'll kick you off the network and so on they're not allowing you to do what you want to do um, it's an unbalanced power distribution between inner and outer nodes and entities, which means that the controlling entity basically has more power than everyone else. And there's a struggle because there's a failure to meet the real needs of everyone in the network because of this power imbalance. And in society, it's a wealth and a, a wealth gap. On a social network, it could be a power gap or or both a wealth and power gap. So it basically means that the kind of uh, the the entities and people further away from the center get less of what they need and, and that's not a good thing and um, just because you are for some reason not the center of a system doesn't mean say you should be not getting what you need in life that's you know that's just not right um, so they're also prone to corruption censorship and competition um, because people are vying for that central power and there's a tendency for exploitation and abuse and, th and very importantly, there's a single point of failure, which means if this central node fails, you know, let's say it's all working perfectly and you've got a really good monarch or corporate boss or whatever, and they genuinely are a really good person looking out for everyone's needs, still working well, uh, you know, that person could still have a bad day, could still die, could, whatever it is, the company could, you know, have problems internally. When that happens, the whole network collapses because these other nodes can't talk to each other properly. So the whole thing has to be rebuilt. Um, you know, it stops the whole thing working if the central node has a problem. That's not a good design at all. That, I mean, that's terrible, really. It's the worst possible design. Um, so re in terms of resource allocation and dispute resolution, which is, you know, that's kind of tends to be a, um, the role of a government, let's say, in society or, or part of the role of a government and also a corporate um, hierarchy. You know, there, there's a sort of uh, delegation of power that happens in both of those systems so that the resources available to the group um, are able to be distributed according to a, a kind of plan where each entity gets a certain amount to, to resource, a budget, basically. Uh, and that then opens the door to um, a situation, again, because of the power imbalance, uh, you have a situation often where there's almost a sort of begging and pleading involved. And if there isn't enough resources going around or if it isn't balanced out correctly, then those who don't have enough are really stuck because they they're not in a position to directly change things. They can't just decide for themselves. They have to kind of go to a higher boss 
uh, and often that can literally result in begging and pleading. Um, you know, and we see that in cities where you've got very poor people begging on the streets on one level. You see in courts where they literally use the word pleading in court. You know, that's because there's a power imbalance. It's not because the person wants to go in there and plead. It's because the whole thing's been set up in a sort of out of balance way. And that's also why in courts you have the, the judge's chair set up higher than everyone else's. It's just this mind game being set to make you think and to be intimidated and make you think that they're more powerful than you are. Uh, I would suggest that's not how I, most people would choose to set up a system where it's human and friendly and we're actually trying to evolve and solve problems. I would suggest that's set up by people who want to dominate other people. Um, so the equivalent in society of a centralised system would be a monarchy or a dictatorship or something of that nature. And in software terms, as I said, I mean, you've got Facebook, Google, Microsoft Windows, these systems that are private enterprises and have a central body regulating and controlling them and where the average user doesn't really have much involvement in them. Um, we see many problems with uh, centralisation throughout the human story. One of the most obvious is state communism where it was sold to the world as being something that's decentralised and you know it's going to be for everyone and everyone's going to benefit, but in reality it was super centralised um, ultimately because the people involved were able to become you know something like a dictator and a monarch anyway um, and resulting in millions being killed because people I guess were, were tricked even more than they were with the monarch. At least with the monarch they know that, that there's a problem. With communism you know many people thought it actually was a real evolution and a solution. Uh, at least as it was uh, acted out. Um, so almost all power is centralised under the threat of violence, resulting in massive death and suffering. Um, the suffering is often denied in favour of marketing images of a glorious leader and other iconography. So we see that in North Korea and um, other places where you, uh, you know, even in Iraq and places like that, we weren't communists, uh, where you've got these big, you know, posters of the glorious leader and they invented everything from golf to baby milk. Um, and you know they're literally virtually a god and we're just going to literally block out the fact that half the country doesn't have any food um, because you know the glorious leader is so amazing basically so why are you even worried about the fact that you, you don't have food I mean we've got this amazing person <laughs> obviously it's completely illogical it's brainwashing but but that's you know that's what's been done amazingly so if we look now in more in detail at decentralized systems so Characterised by transition, that's how I've, I've sort of characterised them, and there's a reason for that. So um, they have space for change within them, they're, they're sort of opening things up, they're less controlled, but they're, they're still controlled, but there's more entities, so there's more scope for discussion, there's more scope for alternatives and debate and power sharing. So ultimately there's more change. Um, there's a better batter, uh, better batter, better balance of, of power distribution between the nodes, um, and there's, as I said, allow for, allowance for greater variation. Um, there's still competition and corruption and obviously since in society this is we can sort of relate this to representative democracy as we have in America and Britain although technically America's a republic um, the sort of democratic process or the the idea of having groups um, voting for policies and so on uh, sharing power obviously it's still absolutely rife with corruption votes are sold um, there's still lots and lots of competition probably even more competition in a sense um, because there's more things, because the power's more up for grabs than it is in a truly centralised system, you've got perhaps a lot more competition. And change can be blocked, fundamentally. So just like with a monarchy or a centralised system, um, the change that's needed can actually be blocked by people who just for whatever reason disagree with it. Um, Exploitation is more difficult, but collusion is still possible. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a step towards balance, but it's still it's an intermediary step it's not quite there, um, and we know from experience that the democracies around the world, whilst being better than a totalitarian state such as the Soviet Union or something like that, um, they still have a lot of problems, and they definitely aren't perfect. Uh, so in software, interestingly, you know, that we a model that fits representational representational democracy sort of level and within society would be something like most cryptocurrencies, where there isn't necessarily a central um, body controlling everything always but there is a uh, a focus of power in the sense that there are certain entities and groups who have more money invested in the system and more technology used to run the system than others do so they actually get more power to determine what happens on the network and actually bitcoin is that way um, with the miners heavily focused in china um, 
and even Steam, which is uh, a blockchain that I like for social networking, which is a great improvement over the centralized competitors like Facebook and so on, for many reasons. But it still has a focused centralization of power, which puts a lot of people off. And, you know, they, they're looking for change to, um, they want to sort of get away from the uh, censored and controlled world of corporate dominated um, society. And they look to cryptocurrencies to provide that. But then they come to Steam and find that it, many of the problems we see in the offline world are repeated on Steam in that you have this centralization of power. Um, most of the tokens are held by a very small number of people. And since the tokens give the ability to vote, it basically means that, uh, you know, there's the smaller entities, the newer people, have a lot less ability to, to effect change. Now, in a way, that makes sense. And, you know, it's justified by the in the design of Steam um, in that you have a proof of stake algorithm, which basically means the idea is you're meant to show that you're heavily invested. In, the more invested you are in the success of the network, uh, in theory, the more you are likely to want to work to make the, the network work well. So that's justification for that. Whereas somebody who comes in who's just new shouldn't really be able to make important decisions and make and changes to the system because A, they probably don't even know so much about it and B, they haven't got as much to lose as someone else. There is a logic to that and I'm not knocking it. I mean, that's it's sensible. But at the same time, there's lots of problems with that as well. So, you know, just because you have the most money invested in something doesn't mean to say you understand it the best or you're going to make the best decisions for it, even from a profit perspective. Um, and... You know, just because someone else doesn't have as much money as that person doesn't mean to say they don't know actually what would make the system more money if you're just looking at it purely from a money perspective. Uh, you know, I mean, that's ultimately, in a sense, why very wealthy people hire very intelligent people to do jobs for them. Um, because those very intelligent people know how to do the things that the very wealthy people don't know how to do. Uh, having lots of money doesn't mean to say you're the most competent to make decisions for, for a system. And... You know, those whales and heavy investors do have the opportunity to talk to and listen to, you know, other specialists. And I'm not saying they don't. Um, but ultimately, the power still lies with them. And even if we set that aside, it's possible for corrupt entities to just come in and uh, use their huge wealth to take over the system. So, uh, you know, people that are the big bosses in centralized systems who have huge wealth accumulated over a long period of time can just come in and, and buy up power in a decentralized system. And it basically then becomes centralised, just like the old centralised systems, but it looks decentralised, which in a way is worse because it gives you the impression that it is an improvement when it isn't. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that with cryptocurrencies because we can fork the systems, which means that if we don't like the way something's being run, then people can just make a new copy of it and make a new version and so on. But, um, you know, it means you've got to change the design away from proof of stake in order to get away from this potential problem. So decentralization of political power theoretically brings more power to the people. As I was saying, whistleblowers, court cases and centuries of direct experience show that dirty tricks are used deliberately to control power and withhold it from as many people as possible. To fully decentralize power in society requires empowered individuals, intelligence and understanding sufficient to ensure that real causes of challenges are found instead of relying on violence and control. Willingness to allow free will to fulfill its evolutionary role. And all of these three points are routinely laser targeted by governments in order to limit them as much as possible, especially when true realisation of them would result in less power for the government. So I'm describing really two counter directions within society. You've got the need of humanity to evolve and awaken and become more empowered. And then you've got the belief of those who are currently at the top of control hierarchies um, motivating the opposite. They're doing everything they can to try to stop the evolution and the awakening because they will lose power and they're frightened of that. And they don't want to lose power. Ultimately, because, you know, if you're in that sort of aggressive, overpowering, evil kind of mindset, then you probably are going to assume that when people find out what you've really been doing to them, they're going to just kill you because they're going to be angry and so on. And, you know, in some cases, that's probably true. They probably would try and kill you. But the paradox or the annoying thing is that if if these kind of controllers just stopped controlling everyone else and allowed them to evolve into compassion and balance and self-empowerment, then those people would be wise enough to evolve out of just hate-filled uh, retribution and would actually you know, be able to do something to help the uh, controllers to evolve without murdering them. So that's why I would suggest this is how you have evolution without violence. Um, we just need to stop controlling. Well, that's step one anyway. Um, so... 
I had a point to make about staying there. I'm just thinking back to it in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of education. So people have been talking about the need to have a culture shift on Steam because Steam uh, is a very excellent genius system, but it has a flaw in that the money used to pay out posts uh, has to come from somewhere and it comes from people buying the tokens. And if we don't have a way of continually bringing in more money, then there's no way to pay out money at any decent rate and the system will fail. So we need a culture shift, which is actually a process of leading people to become empowered to... Um, to know how to uh, work in a socio-economic system like Steam, and uh, to actually, ultimately, effectively become producers of value in their own right, and you know that might take the form of them offering services or businesses, or many other forms. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to their own free will. So whatever they're able to use their free will to do to provide some value to the network, as long as that actually end the end result of that is they bring in more money than they put out. Uh, or they take from the network, then the price of Steam is going to go up and the system is going to thrive and succeed. So it's about finding that balance within each individual and within the network as a whole. And that's how we, we have lasting success. And that's not just in Steam or a cryptocurrency, but that's in absolutely any system that involves people from a, from a nation to a private club or anything, or a football or even a sports team. So distributed systems are the third model and this is the one that I favour and we don't have too many examples of these because they're, they're quite a challenge to create. I think we need to focus a lot more onto this to get accepted um, logic and uh, let's say equations that can be relied on to make these kind of systems work effectively. Uh, I think this is where the world's heading but it's a, a challenge let's say. So this is why I listed decentralised as transition because um, decentralization is a transition from, from my perspective from centralization to distributed systems uh, often people sort of don't really talk about distributed systems they, they seem to um, even I did as well t tend to sort of think of decentralization as being distributed but they are technically two different things so distributed systems from my perspective have a respect for free will that's their codifying or identifying um, aspect there's an equal ability to participate and share responsibility. Uh, share responsibility. So, notice people get a bit concerned when I when when I talk about things like this, and they they might jump to the conclusion that I'm talking about communism, and that somehow uh, you know everything they've got is going to be taken from them, and you know people they class as being incompetent will suddenly have the ability to dictate their life to them. That's not what respect for free will means. Respect for free will means your power is your power. Their power is their power. And you don't try and mess with their power and they don't try and mess with your power and you work together and you learn to respect each other's free will and you might not like what they're doing, you might not agree with it, but as long as they're not overpowering free will, you know, you just let them go on with it. And uh, it's tricky when we share a planet, you know, it's quite complicated and we're sharing water systems and so on, but there is always a way to understand that if someone's polluting a river that you need to drink from and your free will is, you know for a fact and really everyone knows that you need to drink that water to survive, then they are overpowering free will itself. Uh, free will wants to survive. That's the nature of free will. Um, so if anything is done to prevent free will and, and uh, prevent survival, then obviously that's not respect for free will. It's against free will. And steps can be taken then to, to balance that out. Um, we can go into more detail about um, how that might play out. Uh, but there's a lot more on the ground to cover before we reach that. So... Uh, it's also characterised by a potential for optimal balance of power distribution between entities. So this sort of model allows for optimal balance of power. It doesn't force it on anyone. It doesn't force balance of power. It, it allows for it. It makes space for it so that the entities involved can adjust themselves in a way that feels good and that actually results in, in good balance. Um, the other models, the decentralised model and the centralised model, actually don't allow for the optimal balance of power because of the basic structure means it's basically actually, well, it's very difficult to have complete balance power. You can have the central nodes operating in a way that is very efficient and very effective at, at allowing balance, but the only way they can really do that is by sitting back and uh, not really doing very much, affecting anyone else. So it inherently flips the system to be like this anyway, eventually. So again, that's why I list, laid, listed that as transition for decentralization. Total individual freedom. Oh, scary. Sounds dangerous. Um, responsibility and self-empowerment. Mm, not so dangerous. 
So in order to have total individual freedom, you must also have total responsibility and self-empowerment. Um, you can't have one without the other. And this is where we fall down in our current systems, really. Um, basically, there's been this idea, and even even if it was in the, the leaked document from Google a few weeks ago called The Good Censor, um, whereby Google commissioned a large document to be written by various influencers around the world, asking to give them feedback on the world's perception on Google as a censor and, uh, you know, limiting of information. And, you know, I suggest looking at that, but it's a very interesting document. But one of the conclusions reached by one of the main speakers in there was, um, who was kind of guiding the narrative, really, was saying, oh, well, freedom on the internet hasn't worked. We, you know, we tried that and people are just bad. They can't be trusted. So we have to control them. That's really the gist of it. And I don't agree with that. But, but ultimately... It's not that people are just bad, it's that they aren't taking responsibility for themselves, they aren't self-empowered enough to feel good and have balance. They're not wise enough, ultimately, to know um, the necessity of doing these things and the importance of, of doing that in order to maintain their own individual freedom. If you go around slapping people every day, you know, you're going to lose your freedom, basically, because people are either going to, eventually, if it gets extreme, they're going to kill you, or they're going to lock you up or something to stop you slapping them. You know, you have to have some sense of respect and balance in order to have freedom. Uh, it's just that you know, there's no real way around that. If you cause pain to other people and their only way of stopping you doing that is by causing you pain and limiting your freedom, then that's going to happen probably. You're going to meet your match. Um, higher level of wisdom required means higher potential. So, um, so just to point out that in terms of social systems and politics, really a distributed system is most akin to anarchy, I would say. Um, and anarchy, the literal meaning of anarchy is no rulers. That's all it means, no rulers. So it doesn't mean running down a street throwing bins through shop windows. It means no rulers. It doesn't mean no rules. It means no rulers. Uh, so, for example, it basically means you can make rules for yourself. You can agree rules with other people and you all agree to abide by them. But you don't have a ruler making rules for you or for someone else and forcing them onto you. That's the difference. So I think when people... Th you know, the media presents ideas of anarchists as being dangerous and, you know, lawless violence. In reality, I'd say that's quite a controlled narrative and it's probably been done deliberately to make people look away from anarchy. But, um, but yeah, there are people around who, who class themselves as anarchists and will happily go be very anti-capitalist and smash up shops and things. And they're doing that partially out of frustration and anger, but they're also doing it because they recognise that these centralised systems prevent real freedom and, and, and uh, free will. So they're making a statement. But here's the thing. As soon as you act with violence, you are overpowering someone else. Um, so you're effectively setting yourself up as a ruler and you are um, breaking anarchy. So violence doesn't support anarchy at all. You, or anarchy doesn't support violence at all. You can't... As soon as violence exists, anarchy has ended. So you can say you're an anarchist in, uh, in process or something like that if you're being violent, but you're not an anarchist. Um... And it's tricky because when you're being oppressed, let's say, as you might see it, by a world dominated by you know conglomerates and corporations and very wealthy trillionaires and so on, and you have nothing, you know, it's very understandable. Uh, I'm somebody who's who's known very rich people and very poor people. I've lived with very rich people, lived with very poor people at different points in my life, and I understand both angles. Um, I tend to have more respect for the poorer people uh, because they tend to have done less bad things. Um, despite what people might think, um, on average. I think what it comes down to, though, is that that's a bit of a judgment, and in reality, there are good and bad people at all levels of society. Uh, there are people, or even that's a judgment, there are people who will do good or bad things at any given moment, in, all throughout society. Anyone has the potential to do a good or a bad thing at any moment. Um, so, I can, the point I'm making really is I can understand when, let's say, poorer people in this financial artificially created financial system of measuring worth, uh, which I don't fully agree with either. But when people who are less well off, let's say, and don't potentially have enough resources, see all of this corporate domination, they want to fight back. They want to do something about it. I can understand that. They just haven't fully understood and appreciated the process of balance that you can find to achieve that. Um, and so they just get frustrated and go and smash up shops and things. Um, you know, maybe, the, you know, I'm not going to say that's necessary, I'm sure there's a better way of doing that, but if no one's listening to them, which they probably aren't, then, um, you know, it's understandable, they would just get frustrated and um, probably don't achieve a great deal by doing that, but 
at least they're noticed I guess is what they're probably thinking um, but we need as, as long as society is adult and mature enough to recognise the need that all voices are heard as democracy is meant to but really doesn't um, then this wouldn't happen and it, so really this is a failure of democracy it's a failure of the pro-democratic thinking that results in anarchists smashing up shop windows because if anarchists had a real voice that was you know, real for them that would result in them being heard then they probably wouldn't reach that point of frustration um, and it's interesting that you know in software peer-to-peer -peer networks such as BitTorrent um, file sharing networks uh, which are actually being made illegal uh, in most well many countries in Britain anyway um, they the people behind those went into uh, went on in some in Iceland for example to form a political party called the Pirate Party in honor of the Pirate Bay a big BitTorrent website and they won seats in the Parliament and you know ordinarily people of that persuasion wouldn't want to get involved in that because they would just say well it's we know that that system's corrupt we want to make something better but in that case they actually you know had enough public support to actually get seats in the democracy um, I'm not an expert in Icelandic politics so I can't really speak to exactly how well that's worked out but uh, that's one of the probably the only example I know of where that's really happened in recent years um, and you know maybe they're going to make change over time and maybe eventually they'll dissolve or evolve, let's say, uh, the democratic system so it works better. Um, and this is the thing about anarchism, it's very misunderstood by people who haven't really sat and thought about it enough and talked to people involved in it in the sort of wiser end of things. Um, anarchism, ultimately, at its heart, is aiming to create freedom and to create a better life for everyone without forcing anything on anyone. Uh, it's not about forcing anything, it's voluntary, it's voluntarism, ultimately. Uh, and we've been sold the idea by the control freaks that anarchism is not about that, it's about somehow forcing destruction of the prevailing systems and, uh, and ruining everything for everyone who happens to have worked hard and built up their wealth and all this stuff. It's not about that at all. If, if, you, if you're doing good things for humanity, you will get to keep what you deserve to keep in an anarchistic system. That's the idea of it. It's meant to be balanced. It's meant to be honest and real. Um, so, from my perspective anyway so it would be great if people would just get that into their head and look at things a bit differently and, and consider the alternatives uh, clearly democracy causes millions of deaths huge starvation problems and so on um, and only the most closed minded and people who are very greatly programmed to uh, imagine that only communism is the only alternative or something like that is the only alternative to democracy so many people as soon as you say oh I'm not really so behind dem democracy they're, they're heavily programmed to say oh you must be a communist no, I'm not a communist either. Um, neutral, let's go to neutral. Uh, mesh networks, again, that's another system which is um, based using connecting together mobile phones to make a kind of non-centralised network for sharing data. Not very common. Uh, I don't really use mobile phones, so I'm not really going to get into that too much. But, you know, BitTorrent is a way of sharing files um, and governments don't like it and copyright holders don't like it because it means that the people get the power to just share data which um, freely, which, um, you know, they see as, oh, we've lost money because people are able to share movies and things that they haven't paid for. But, you know, sharing is a basic right as far as I'm concerned. You know, if, if, we, if we have a bunch of apples, um, then it's right that, and, you know, everyone's hungry, it's right that we share them. It's not right that I take them all and say, screw you all, they're my apples. That's how I see it. Uh, I don't want anyone to suffer, and I think, you know, if you're going to be willing to allow other people to suffer while you don't, then you probably shouldn't, be, you know, you're not the fittest to survive. Let's put it like that. If you're going to cut off everyone else's needs to suit your own, then that isn't survival of the fittest, that's survival of a psychopath, really. And that's not what, that's really what's happened on this planet. We've got survival of psychopathy instead of survival of the fittest, and it's been called survival of the fittest. Um, so we need to, and we're not, we, we may not survive as a result of that. Humanity literally may not survive because of this backwardsness. Um, and we really need to wake up to that. Um, and I know when you're in this system and believing all the things that we've been told, it can seem like, um, you know, some of the things I'm saying here can't be true, but I'm just suggesting maybe think about it a bit cl more closely and you might find that some of the things you've been told actually aren't right by other people, let's say, by schooling and government and so on. Um, oh, skip two there, not sure why, let's get that one. Okay, so distributed systems are rare and often demonised by those who seek control and overpowering. Fear of the empowerment of others does not tend to exist in those who live in balance. 
So that's really what I was pointing at there. If you yourself are balanced and powerful and you understand balance and you understand why people go out of balance and you understand how to help people come back into balance, then you aren't afraid anymore of other people having power because you, you can understand correctly what's happening. You can, you're powerful enough yourself to take steps to make sure they don't overpower you. And if you're in communication with them through your heart, you're living in your heart, you're actually open to open-minded and interacting with other people, then you can negotiate, discuss, and come into balance together instead of suddenly finding there's this random person you've never seen before who wants to kill you for some reason. Communication is key, ultimately. And again, that's why STEAM and, and social networks online are so important, um, because they, they open the door to real communication. When, when the internet first really became big, I was really excited because I thought, oh, wow, this is, this is going to be the thing that actually solves so many of our problems, because now the world can communicate and we'll see that we're all much more similar than we thought we were. We'll see through the lives, we won't fight each other anymore. And I think that is happening on a lot of levels, but we've also had the counter movement of the controlling entities trying to maintain that division uh, and stop each other talking to, stop us talking to each other. I don't think, you know, when you've got countries that have got firewalls around them and the, the people aren't allowed to talk to everyone else in the world and they tell them, oh, it's because the world is dangerous and these people are bad and they're going to corrupt you. No, it's not. It's because when you talk to those other people, you're going to realise they aren't as bad or the bad people that you thought they were. They're actually a lot like you and they've actually got things that you want and that your government's keeping from you, basically. And I think that's clear to, to most people at this point, but obviously not to people, let's say, in China or North Korea, uh, behind a firewall, as I understand it. Um, so distributed systems can still involve rules that can prevent exploitation, abuse and overpowering. Uh, so when it comes to something like a blockchain, for example, it's voluntary to use that. You're not forced to use it. So therefore, by using it, you are agreeing to use the rules of the system. Just like you do when you use Facebook as well. You're agreeing to use the rules of that system. Um, you can choose not to use Facebook and you can choose not to use a blockchain. However, the difference between a decentralised or distributed social system and something like Facebook is that the system will include within it some mechanism for you being able to change the rules or at least vote on them, whereas Facebook definitely doesn't have that. Um, even if most of the users uh, petition Facebook to change something, then under no obligation to change it. Whereas with a distributed system, the thing will change automatically when it's voted for it to change. Um, it's quite a key difference, really. Um, instead of you having to wait before everyone bails out of Facebook because they don't like something for that thing to be changed, instead, the collective will of the people can actually change it directly. And that's very, very powerful, very important. Um, the specific nature of a distributed system is much more open and subjective than other forms of system. They're ideally designed to adapt and grow with our needs very quickly. Awesome stuff. So, controversy on the road to balance. Um, controlled mainstream media often mischaracterises anarchy as dangerous and projects that control must be present. Um, people are placated, which means they're kind of made peaceful, by belief in a fake representational democracy. Um, so we're told that democracy is the answer to the world's problems and we're going to go and fight for freedom and kill all these people somehow it's going to make everyone free um, in reality the democracies are not even real democracies I mean even though democracy even a real democracy has major flaws in it but what we have is not even a real democracy it's, uh, it's fake and if you look at um, this isn't just some theory if you, if you read um, the books by the Ivy League historian Carol Quigley who was uh, very famous in America um, in the 1960s a kind of very respected academic, and um, the long and the short of it is he was commissioned by a social, um, a secret society who were identified in the books as, as being called The Network, who were basically a group of billionaires and very rich people who had clubbed together to f bring about a vision of, of life on Earth, and in, in secret, and they're named, the families are named in these books that he wrote. Basically, they commissioned him to write a history of their group. And they gave him access to all their documents, and he did this massive book. And then he published it, and he wasn't meant to publish it. And I still don't fully understand how that happened. But obviously, they, they thought it was going to be a private book for them, and it got published through Penguin Books. <laughs> um, uh, but the thing was, the book was so massive and dry, a lot of it was really dry historical information, that not many people read it. And the really explosive information was at the end of the book. So uh, only a very small number of people actually learnt this, you know, the amazing facts that were in this book. And after about nine months, it got pulled by Penguin Books. And if you tried to order it, they would say, oh, no, we, there wasn't, wasn't enough interest in it. It's out of publication. You know, when enough people want interest in it again or have interest in it again, then we'll, we'll publish it again. And obviously they never did because they were told not to publish it again. Uh, I've got a video from Carol Quigley talking about that on my YouTube channel. 
uh, at the time. And so, but it got republished again um, in recent decades, and I've got it, and you can get it. And there's a book called, uh, it, it, what, the main book is called Tragedy and Hope. Um, and there's a book called Tragedy and Hope 101 by a guy called Joe Plummer, who actually, uh, he broke down that book into an easy bite-sized chunk so that you can get the gist of it. And it basically says that, uh, you know, this group of people started out with Cecil Rhodes, who was one of the people um, who basically was responsible from the English Empire, British Empire, of raping Africa and Rhodesia, the country was named after him. He had this view that English men were the best people on earth and that they should run the whole world. So he took the vast wealth that he generated through raping Africa and put it into this secret society that was designed to make this happen from behind the scenes. And part of it was that they infiltrated and took over democracies and, and basically made them deliberately look like they were enacting the will of the people, but in reality they never were. And this is why it really makes no difference which political party gets into quote-unquote power. Uh, the policies never really change that much. Um, and you might have all these debates and, oh, this person's won and this person's in, this person's out. But the actual general direction that the governments take always goes in more or less the same direction. Um, funny that. So, yeah, uh, people are sort of, because they don't know that this, the scale of this uh, scam, I mean, I always say that people's scam detectors in their brains are not calibrated for such big scams. They're used to thinking of credit card thefts and um, things of that nature. They're not used to thinking that everything they've ever been taught since they were a child was actually based on a big coordinated lie. Um, they're, they're more trusting than that. And, you know, it's good that people are trusting. They, you know, they've been hopefully raised by loving parents. You know, the people they meet are trustworthy to some extent, but the people that run governments are not those kinds of people. That's what it really comes down to. They're, they're, typically, they are um, more prone towards psychopathy than for health, and they work together. It's not a good situation. So, um, you know, really our own survival depends on us solving this problem and understanding it on every level. Uh, decentralised systems are often a compromise that gives the appearance of being fair, but which... Uh, still allow for domination, imbalance and power struggles. So that's what I was saying about representational democracy in Bitcoin. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're an improvement, but they can give you a false sense of security. Many cryptocurrencies are controlled by miners and large token holders, which I've already covered. Um, and as I said, Bitcoin, BitTorrent was made it illegal um, by centralised sort of groups. Oh, oh, come back. So, true freedom. Anarchy, as I said earlier on, only means no rulers gone through this already really um yep covered that so freely and voluntarily sharing does not imply loss of services or things um which again speaks to that whole thing about you know the idea that sharing results in communism um one one interesting group is the ubuntu movement out of south africa run by a guy called michael tellinger or devised by him and it's based on ancient african principles uh, he's a historian archaeologist who found out certain things about the way life was coordinated uh, historically in Africa. And it's a principle kind of along the lines of basically if it's not good for everyone it's not good. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that uh, one person gets to decide what's good for everyone and you have to fit in with it and say it's good. It means if literally something is not good for literally everyone then it isn't actually good. And that's quite a good, you know, I like that. Um, we don't have too much experience of working with that way of thinking. Um, I would like to to live that way and find out how well that works. Uh, they have a whole system, actually, of, uh, of building towns and, and nations based on that principle and, and on an economic level. And it's being done already. It's being done in South America and Africa, and it seems to be working pretty well. So uh, voluntary action is very, very important and very, very much being denied right now by our current economic and capitalist thinking. Or oh, let's say over-capitalist thinking, over-dominating capitalism. Um, rulers don't provide the things we need. We all have pieces of the puzzle. It's very important. The idea that you can't live without a ruler is illogical. I personally have never, I don't know of a single ruler in any corporation, in any government, that has given me something that we couldn't have achieved or created amongst ourselves as a community anyway. And I think in most cases we could have achieved it better. Um, people need to be free to create their own destiny and learn from their own mistakes. That's the evolutionary process right there. You can't learn and, uh, at the best rate for you while you aren't even allowed to make the mistakes and to learn from them, full stop. So, so important. So, the future of the internet. Um, obviously, I'm not telling you I know what the future of the internet is. This is just what I see right now. Um, 
Current decentralized online systems, such as cryptocurrencies and social platforms, including those found on the Steam ecosystem, are a stepping stone. DAC and DAO, um, decentralized autonomous corporations or communities or um, organizations, com com this is a definition from Wikipedia, I think, commuter-managed autonomous community and corporation has the potential for balancing groups of people. So this is taking the idea of a blockchain and smart contract type of ideas that we see on Ethereum and other networks and applying it to actually organizing people in a, in a real world way. So when uh, EOS, the network created by Dan Larimer after Steam, uh, was created, it's a more sort of business oriented uh, operating system version of a blockchain. Uh, he, he carried on his vision of making governments irrelevant and, and they got two billion dollars funding for that project, uh, I think. And that's a lot of money to put behind a project that's stated objective is to make governments irrelevant. And, uh, you know, let's see what they do. But they actually have a, an arbitration process in that they have contract management. Um, many of the functions of government and court systems are covered by that system and it's run by a computer. So, or many computers. You know, it's, I, I'm, I'm a human person. I'm a soul. Uh, hence my name, you're a soul. And uh, part of that means I don't want to pass any of my responsibility on to a computer, basically. Computers are meant to be tools that we can use to make things happen. They're not meant to be something that dictates anything to us. So any DAC or DAO can only work if it has full respect for free will and is ultimately distributed rather than decentralised. So it may be that early versions of EOS don't work so well and have all these problems. I know they already are having those kind of problems. Uh, actually, with uh, governance and, and voting and things like that. Um, you know, when I read the white paper for, for the EOS, I could see this was going to happen. I could see they hadn't thought it through well enough and they were sort of getting a bit ahead of themselves or, or rushing in from the technology perspective and maybe looking to solve the um, structural systems, structural challenges and social challenges afterwards. Um, you know, that's a personal decision for people working on the project. I, I think they probably should have put a bit more thought into this. But anyway... Um, Something like this I see being the future. It might take a few years to evolve to the point where it's actually workable for most people. It basically means that instead of working for a corporation with a hierarchy and a boss and all this stuff, um, you would have, let's say, a community that has a particular objective, let's say making cars as an example, and people can just come along and sign up and log on to the network without a contract, and, and they agree to the terms of the of the group, and they can just do whatever they want to do, and the community, whatever the services they can bring, they bring, and the community determines what happens and uh, as long as the um, community and the rules involved are fair and well thought out then things can actually work out well it's a bit like having a, a republic i suppose as i understand it but one where it's completely transparent and everyone has a say instead of having any representatives talking for you um, and it can ultimately become what the community wants it to become it's not like i get to decide what a dac is it's what it becomes as a result of people choosing it so that ultimately is, is a kind of digital expression of free will from what I understand it um, to be. And I'm very excited to see where we go with that in the future. Um, the future of the Internet is with distributed systems and networks. Devices are combined to share the load. So again, instead of having big networks of uh, or, or networks of big computers, either like Facebook's massive networks. I remember 10 plus years ago it was said that Facebook alone used the amount of electricity that Brazil uses to run their servers which is, I mean, it's ridiculous uh, to have all these people doing playing farming games and it's using the amount of electricity needed to actually run a country that has farming in it. I mean, it's just, it literally is insanity. Um, so with Steam and distributed uh, decentralized systems, you've also got lots of computers being used. Um, they just happen to be in different locations. Um, distributed networks are something different. So you don't actually even necessarily have big servers in distributed networks. Uh, you actually have the processing is distributed amongst the end users. So for example, with file sharing and BitTorrent, um, whoever's running a file sharing system to share files is actually dedicating part of the processing of their machine to make that network work. Now, when we consider that all of the users in the network are gonna have a device on anyway, that actually is gonna be doing stuff and using electricity anyway, regardless of whether this network exists, then I haven't actually seen data on this, but I suspect it may be more efficient to have a distributed system in the sense that everyone's phone or computer puts a little bit of its power into running the network and shares the load. Um, it might be more efficient to do that than having any form of centralization or even decent, you know, middle middle tier decentralization. I haven't seen data on that. I would like to see that if it exists somewhere. Um, but even if that isn't the case, the fact remains that um, having a network spread out by so many different people 
is ultimately more secure, it's safer. Um, it means there's the network's much more difficult to take down. Um, and you know, unless there's a bug in the code that's on everyone's machine that brings the whole system down. Uh, you know, if if a government or some entity tries to shut the network down, they're gonna have a hard time. Um, so yeah, that's lots of good points f from that perspective regarding distributed systems and why I see it as being part of the future. Um, so yeah, I've kind of covered that. So shifting the balance, how do we move from centralized systems to decentralized? Well, banks are very centralized systems. Um, I've, I've worked actually making systems for banks um, very early on in my career. And, you know, there's there's plus points to centralization in that you get experts working there. You get um, you should have a kind of focus for for expertise regarding that system. But now, but that you know that was in the past. That was before we had great communications and the ability to to sort of spread out around the world and still work together. And I think any of those benefits really are massively outweighed by the the cons to um, to centralization with banks and things. So. For a long time, I wasn't really for cryptocurrencies actually because I, I thought they weren't enough of an improvement over the old way. And I think that was really before I fully understood distributed systems. And we don't really properly have that yet. So, you know, it's understandable that I was against cryptocurrencies. But people want to use money is what it comes down to. And, I, you know, I would like to personally evolve to a state where we don't use money. Uh, that requires a lot of evolution and learning and change. It's going to take a while. And so I don't have a problem in the meantime of using cryptocurrencies or something like that to allow us to trade and it's definitely an improvement over fiat currencies and centralized things like dollars and, and euros and so on uh so yeah one thing you can do to decentralize the world is to start using cryptocurrency and there are debit debit cards available now which let you literally go into shops and spend cryptocurrency in shops um so that's pretty interesting and i'm sure that as they spread out more more people use them i don't even have one yet but um as they get more adoption things are going to change i think quite quickly Stop using Facebook and other social networks like that, centralized ones, and start using steam-powered sites or similar sites that are decentralized and that can't be censored. Um, very important step. And, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to get people to stop using Facebook because their friends are there, they've put all this time invested into building a profile. But how many people actually look at your own history, look at all these thousands of posts you've shared and posted over the years? No one. Because, A, they don't have time, often. B, they're totally distracted by so many other posts flying through Facebook. C, Facebook deliberately is designed to make it hard to act as a library of information. It's difficult to find old posts. You know, in the old school forums, you'd have a list of topics. You'd have, you know, comments. In some, th I've seen a thread that on one forum went back five or six, ten years. Hundreds of pages of, of replies from hundreds of people on important subjects. That's a really powerful thing to have, but in terms of for learning and sharing information. But Facebook really makes that difficult, and I'd say they've done that deliberately, to be honest. Partially to keep you addicted to it to keep your dopamine receptors firing up and literally causing addiction in your brain and partially to, to make it difficult to actually mobilize and, and use Facebook as a way to create change. It gives you the illusion of allowing you to be powerful and come together with people but makes it very difficult for people to actually consistently work together um, and hence we see lots of arguments and, and people just don't feel good using Facebook. Other networks I've used are much more productive. Steam is much more productive. People work together, they have fun, they enjoy themselves a lot more. Even even in the harder times when, when cryptocurrency prices have crashed, um, as they have now. And I'm going to get onto that in the next few slides as well, very specifically. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to get people leaving Facebook. But the more people leave Facebook and use these other sites and start evangelizing them and really seeing the benefits and putting their energy into making them work, the less power Facebook's going to have. And I think that's going to be good for everyone. Embody self-sovereignty. So we're told that, for example, a monarch is sovereign. The so all the power is the monarch's. The people have decided that the monarch must have the sovereignty. Well, no, they haven't. It was forced onto them at birth. Everyone is sovereign. Everyone is a free will being. You have your own power. Use it. And, and know yourself, ultimately. Ancient saying, know yourself, know thyself. Very important. Live from the heart. I could talk for a month on that subject alone, but um, the heart is the balancing organ of your system, of yourself. And if you just stop for the moment your mental acquisition of information... Maybe pause the video, drop into your heart and feel into your heart. You're going to realise that there's more of you in your heart and you were thinking in there all along and you've been doing things in your heart all along and maybe you haven't noticed so much. Um, but the more you shift more into your heart and allow your heart to be a focus of your consciousness, the more you'll start to change the way you think about certain things and you'll feel more, you'll hear more 
Notice that the word heart has here in it. It's also an anagram of earth, uh, so you can ponder that a while as well. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to go too deeply into that. It's a huge subject, but I, I see this, this topic that I'm talking about here in terms of decentralization as being a kind of um, heart-centered form of technology. That's really what I'm aiming for. Uh, and also uh, open source hardware. It's a big thing. It hardly happens, but I think as technology evolves, we're going to see the ability more and more for us to all to create our own hardware. And for that, we need to have designs to make that happen. So we've got open source software, which means we can write and share software easily between each other. At some point, maybe 3D printers or some other technology, we're going to be able to print our own hardware. And that's when things will become, you know, pretty different, pretty interesting. Uh, definitely looking forward to seeing where that goes. So, shifting the balance. Protesting is not an act of freedom. It's an appeal to authority. You aren't fighting for your rights, you're slaves begging for longer chains. This is a very powerful statement. Um, it, it, you know, it, it deserves some consideration. Um, I, you know, I respect people that go out on marches and, and protest to get their voice heard. And I think that's, <clears throat> I think that's the... Um, the only valid use of a protest is to get your voice heard. So you're, you're getting lots of people together to make a lot of noise and therefore they gather focus on them and, and their message is heard. It's a, it's a form of marketing. It shouldn't be a form of um, marketing in the market of ideas, let's say. It's not, um, it's not something that should be used, in my opinion, to actually try to create change. Because if you're forced to have to get lots of people together to march and protest to create change, then you're already not free, as this is alluding to. The problem is not that you need this policy change. The problem is that you're not free in the first place and these changes aren't being enacted. So in other, another way of saying this would be uh, protesting is not an act of power. It's uh, a demonstration of the loss of your own power and you aren't fighting for change. You are, um, let's say, uh, bemoaning the lack of your ability to manifest the change you need. So, moving on to Facebook and Google specifically, um, this is a meme that was posted by Fairseam, Fairseam on uh, on my Steam Passport group a while ago. One comment deleted is a tragedy, a million comments deleted is a statistic, Mark F. Stalinberg. So, for those who don't know, um, Joseph Stalin was a uh, dictator from Soviet Union, Russia, uh, last century, responsible for the death of millions of people, a real psychopath, um, power Munger and uh, Mark um, Zuckerberg is the CEO of Facebook and basically there's a famous quote from Stalin where he basically says one I think it's along the lines of one death is a tragedy a million deaths is a statistic um, in other words you know every people people get together and cry and mourn a death of someone but when a million people are killed it's so overwhelming that it sort of bypasses people's processes for handling that kind of thing and and they just sort of go into a bit of denial about it and it's like, oh, a million people die. Shit, that's really bad. You know, I mean, obviously some people are going to get emotionally triggered and cry about it, but it's such a massive thing that people can't really relate to it. Can't even relate to a million people. I mean, you're not probably likely to meet a million people in your whole life. Um, so, I mean, he's this is written in a way that's sort of evil and, you know, the quote from him, it probably was evil when he said it, but, um, but he's highlighting something important, which is that our psychology is limited most people's it's not ready to handle reality of a situation and he's in a way he's saying i can get away with murdering a million people because the people can't take that in and and they just won't attack me for it so you know this is this is pointing to the fact that facebook has been deleting comments and censoring people and i've got videos of my own experiences on facebook where i've written comments and i've refreshed the page and they've been deleted they're gone immediately and often it's when i've mentioned steam it so that's what we're sort of coming on to here it's also happened on Facebook and YouTube, uh, sorry, YouTube and G Plus as well. So I met a, a lawyer in uh, at Steamfest three, and um, I've got his address at the end of this presentation. Uh, he was presenting at Steamfest three in Poland, and basically he's got a class action lawsuit coming up, uh, running out of Australia against Facebook and Google. Now my own social network Eureka.org, which I put a lot of time into, got delisted by Google. And, you know, you would search for social networks, search for all the keywords relating to my site, and it just wouldn't come up in the results. It would come up in other social uh, uh, search engines, DuckDuckGo and so on. You know, first link, boom, there you go, as it should do in Google, when you search for the keywords relating to my project. It didn't come up in Google. Either it was on page 100 or sometimes it just wasn't there at all. 
Um, so my site was delisted. Now that, you know, that's a problem. That's not nice. It's not fair. And as I understand, you know, my, my network had a lot of information, which was, you know, powerful information for helping solve problems on earth and exposing corruption. And, you know, it's possible that my site got delisted for political reasons. However, a few years later, in fact, not so long ago, a year ago, I think a court case was ended where Google was forced to, I don't know if they've actually paid it, but forced to pay uh, the world's biggest fine ever, I think, something like that, for um, for exactly doing exactly that to other groups. I think they had to pay something like 2.1 billion euros in compensation and fines for delisting sites, just like they did to mine. And I didn't join in on that class action lawsuit because I didn't know about it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it was good to know that ultimately these people can be touched, these corporations can be touched when they oppress others. Um and in this case, what's happened is, basically, um, this is very relevant for people on Steam and people that have cryptocurrency. At the start of 2018, fairly early on, cryptocurrencies were through the roof. The price was really high and they, you know, many people thought they weren't going to stop going up. And then Facebook, and, Google, and then the, the prices crashed, basically. And a lot of people, even I didn't really realise, didn't put two and two together. But around the same time, Facebook and Google had banned um, cryptocurrency advertising. I knew that happened, but I didn't really realise the implications. I didn't think it would have such a big effect. But what's been pointed out is that shortly after that, that was when the price dropped $300 billion of cryptocurrencies across the board. Um, and and as we uh, move through this, you'll see, um, I think on later slides, that fundamentally they're not allowed to do that. They were... Um, antitrust and anti-monopoly laws state that a company cannot prevent competing co uh, companies from using their services. And although Facebook and Google don't have cryptocurrencies, they do have social networks. And many projects using cryptocurrency are social networks, like Steam sites, for example. So if you prevent those projects from um, advertising, just because you say so, because you say, well, we don't like cryptocurrencies, they're, they're dodgy, when, you know, provably they're not, uh, in general, um, then... And in the process of that, you're preventing projects that are social from advertising on your network. You are either deliberately or undeliberately, but you're doing it nonetheless. You are actually preventing your competitors from using your service, which breaches antitrust, anti-monopoly laws. And the lawyer that I met uh, spoke to uh, some detail about this. He's got a great website with lots of information about it. Uh, it's, he's fairly sure this is a very strong case that he's got. Um, and it's being brought in Australia at the moment. Uh, and he says that ultimately, you know, this is literally potentially a $300 billion case because he's seeking compensation for the whole of the cryptocurrency world. Everyone that lost money as a result of cryptocurrency knows diving. They're the result of, of people losing confidence in it because they knew that people wouldn't be able to advertise uh, through the main networks. So as he says here, Facebook and Google developed some clever code 15 years ago and have now eaten the internet. Strategic business model of expansion by acquiring potential competitors in early stage before antitrust law would prohibit good point um you know they don't need to um breach antitrust laws to create a monopoly if they keep buying their competitors they create a monopoly anyway uh, cryptocosm threatens them at two levels by creating competitors who can't be bought due to the decentralized distributed nature uh, and using a fundamentally superior model that provides users control over their own security content and privacy so crypto uh blockchain projects are superior in many ways to the centralized systems and they can't be bought out so just like when a monarch says that um, anarchy is terrible or when mainstream politics says that anarchy is terrible, this is another enactment of the same thing. Centralised tech companies saying that blockchains are bad and we can't allow them kind of thing. So yeah, Facebook and Google control 66% of all online advertising um, and they censored the crypto uh, world basically. Uh, and as he's documented here, that began on 30th of January and by the 6th of February crypto markets were down by 53%. At the time, I didn't put two and two together. There was so much happening at that time, it was difficult to really track exactly what was influencing what. Um, and I didn't really realise, to be honest, the power that Google and Facebook have with regards to online advertising. But now I see the statistics, it's quite clear that what he's saying is probably completely true. Um, and so obviously, as he's put there, Cryptocosm Project's struggle was made seem advertising is blocked. So the ad ban is illegal, and it's also worth pointing out they didn't just ban cryptocurrencies, they also banned a few other different sort of um, industries as well, for different reasons. Um, collective bans of competitors are illegal under Australian law, and anti-competitive cartel conduct enabling claims for da the conduct of these groups uh, enables claims for damages. 
and Australia has jurisdiction over these companies because they do business in Australia and it's also worth noting that this is open to anyone in the rest of the world to sign into this you don't have to be an Australian to do that so the group a company they've created is called JPB Liberty and it's organizing a class action lawsuit against Facebook and Google to get your losses basically back from from this whole problem and uh, to fight back against the censorship too. So anyone on Steam, this is a massive thing and we really should be getting involved in it and really promoting this heavily. I haven't seen too many people talking about this. Um, it really would be great if we could join together to make that happen. It's free to sign up, there's no win, no fee. Um, and they're also running a token system in the spirit of cryptocurrency so that you get more tokens and more shares if you if you sort of do more things, like if you give them more proof of how many tokens you held during that period and so on, you'll get more bonus tokens. Um, it's anonymous, you don't have to give me your name, you know, it's quite clever really I think the way they've done it. You know, I'm not a legal advisor, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm not a medical advisor, I'm not professionally qualified in any of those things, so please don't take anything I'm saying here as a legal fact or legal advice or financial advice or anything like that. Um, disclaimer, I'm just doing the best I can to understand this, I'm just telling you what I'm doing and what I think is probably a good idea, that's it really. Um, you know, if you want professional advice then maybe go seek somebody who's had more professional training than I have. Doesn't make them guaranteed to be right, but you know it's good to perhaps sometimes get an extra insight on those things. Um, so this is the website address for this project, jpbliberty.com. This is the class action lawsuit, and on Steam you've got JPB Liberty and APS Hamilton. Um, Andrew, I think his name is from memory, um, on Steam, and there's his names there on Telegram and Discord if you want to talk to him. Uh, and that's me. So so I've got a website, eureka.org which is a social network, which um, I put a lot of time into at the moment. It's it's still usable. You can still create profiles. You can hang out and talk to people. Um, but mostly it's a repository for information in my research at this point um, because it, I just haven't been able to market it. It hasn't been able to explode. And I ended up putting a lot more of my time into Steam because I realized that Steam was um, had more power behind it than my project did. And I thought maybe at some point they could merge together, perhaps with a smart media token. Maybe they will at some point. Um, but anyway, yeah, you can you can check out Eureka.org if you like, and also I run SteamOcean.com if you want to see stats for Steam. And I am Eura-Soul on Steam, and I'm also on Telegram. So if you want to hit me up there, then you're welcome to. Thanks for listening to this. I know it's gone on for a while, but um, there's a lot of information here. I could literally talk for a lot longer on all of this, and you can tell I'm talking quickly to try and fit it all in. It's a very complicated subject. I mean, I'm really talking about trying to solve most of the world's problems and trying to cram it into an hour and a half or something like that. So... Uh, not really technically possible, but I'm just trying to plant seeds and, and maybe cause people to think a bit differently about certain things and so you can go and do your own research and, and uh, fill in the gaps that you may have on this. And I don't know everything either. I'm looking forward to hearing people's responses and maybe correcting me on things I've gotten wrong. But um, Yeah, so thanks for listening and uh, much love to all and um, I will catch you soon.